with these hands lifted high hear my song hear my cry I will bring the sacrifice I will bring the
bless your name. We praise you, God. We thank you for this time we have to be together, to receive the word, and we keep our eyes fixed on you as we do so together. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's continue with our online service. All right. So happy we're able to share this time together. And if you're joining us for the first time, I'm Pastor Terry Lee, pastor here at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco, and I'm really happy you're with us right now. You know, we're continuing on with our Explore God series. The question that we want to wrestle with today is the truth claims that Jesus made. We really want to answer this big question. Is Jesus God? Was he God's son among us? Is that what he really said he was? Can we believe him? Can we take him at his word? What does that even mean? What are the implications? We're going to be hearing from a professor, in theology, Jeff Louie, also a former pastor here in San Francisco, a good friend of mine, and a good part of our church teaching team over the years. Jeff is gonna be addressing the subject from a perspective that I think you're gonna find provocative, and I believe will bless you. Oh, and before we even begin to let him start that sharing time, I wanna remind everybody, it's something I get to do. It's important, and this is especially for those of you who consider Cornerstone your church home, and this your community, even if it's just online, you're a part of us. I want to remind you about our time of giving, what it means to honor the Lord with your tithes and your offerings. This is something that allows us to continue doing the work that God has put on all of our hearts to do here in San Francisco, but really into the Bay Area and honestly stretching out now into other parts of the world, the digital highways, <laughs> the connections we're having even right now. Yeah, so remember when it comes to giving, like I always say, first give him your heart. Ask the Lord what he wants you to do. 
but maybe consider honoring him. And when you send that in, remember, you can do that to our offices. You can go directly and give through the online opportunity option, the portal that we have there, or you can download our Cornerstone SF app and give that way. But again, I don't think we can ever outgive God. Now, if you're just here as an explorer, you're just starting to seek, don't feel any pressure around that. We just want everybody to be able to be blessed. But if it's in your heart to contribute, please go for it. So even now, Lord Jesus, we pray for your blessing over this good word that we're about to share as we explore the question, is Jesus really God? I'd like to think Jesus is a great person. Uh, I just, I, it's, a, it's to me, it's a silly story. It's idolization, basically. The idea that there's a human being that can be viewed as a God. I, I, I believe it, that uh, the teachings of Jesus, uh, they ring true to me. The way, it makes sense to live that way. Jesus, I believe, was a liberal. And I think looking at where we're going, I think he'd be happy to see that people are becoming more and more accepting. I think I'm, I grow more curious about that every day um, uh, and, and how I can be a better person, um, maybe by following his teachings and, and maybe it will be a, a fit for me and maybe it won't, but you know, I'll, I have a lifetime to figure that out. Hi, I'm Jeff. And I have the honor of being in this series on exploring God, specifically on the topic of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus really God? Now, you got to understand, this is a pretty hard question to answer. Doubly hard because you got like, I got like 30 minutes. I was a seminary professor at graduate school. I got to put on my Dr. Louis cap, you know, and I'd spend hours and hours, a few days on the lectures on the divinity of Christ because it was such an important topic for students, you know? So we're going to divide this sermon into like three different uh, question sections. The first one is what's the biblical evidence? You know, it's got to be biblical because I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to prove it through science, you know? It's got to be from the biblical text, okay? Second is, why is it so important? Why is it needed? You know, can it be optional? It's so sort of like, you know, rubs other religions the wrong way. Can it be optional? And the third question is, you know, what's the benefit for us? There's a benefit to it. So three questions. After I hit the third one, then the sermon is over. So let's look at the first question, okay? What's the evidence, the biblical evidence that Jesus is God, okay? Now, basically, if I put on my theological, my Dr. Louis, Professor Louis cap, okay, um, there's basically three ways you deal with this. First, um, you deal with it through the text. You see, some people saying, oh, you know, this whole divinity of Jesus is made up. You know, you read the Da Vinci Code or something like that. It's all made up by the early Christians. You know, I'll tell you, we don't have time to go through like the, 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 the Council of Constantinople, okay? We just go through the text. But one thing you find from the text is that the, 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 that Jesus is God is not made up, you know, in, in like 400 years after Jesus. It's actually in the text, okay? So we deal with it three ways from the text. First, from like verses that basically declare it, okay? Uh, let's look at one of them, the best one, John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14, okay? It goes like this. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? This is, oh, doesn't, well, you know, doesn't equate the Word with Jesus. It says that the Word was with God, was, was, was God. But let me, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word becomes flesh. You have another really kind of a famous passage in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, these verses are, you know, pretty clear, okay? But then there's also what we call uh, the attributes of God that can be seen in the work and life of Jesus Christ. 
Okay, then what are these attributes, characteristics that are somehow, you know, uh, 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 isolated just for God? Okay, so let's give you one uh, in terms of time. In the New Testament, Jesus has this like hinting of eternality, okay? He says in the book of John, before Abraham, I am, and I was. And they, they, want, they wanted to like kill him because they knew what he was talking about, okay? In the book of the Revelation, it's the, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Then the turn, etern, eternality continues with his resurrection from the dead. And, you know, they can't find the body, okay? And he's at the right hand of God, and he has no beginning and no end, which, like, no human being has that. He's someone who is greater than a human being or just a, a, a great prophet or an inspirational good guy, you know. A second uh, attribute or characteristic that Jesus has is that he's really powerful. You look at the uh, Gospels, and he's doing all these miracles. And, you know, I see miracles kind of regularly in my life in ministry. I don't see them every day. But I see enough in terms of time, in terms of God uh, changing things. Yeah, but the difference between what I see, it's often through prayer, and what Jesus did is he did it on command. That's very different than what I see, you say, because the power and his authority was with himself. Not only is he powerful in terms of his earthly ministry, but according to the writers of, like the, the, the writer of the Apostle Paul, he describes the magnificence of Jesus in a letter he wrote to the, called Ephesians and another one called Colossians. And in Colossians, there is this, this verse, like that Jesus, uh, through him, he created all things and he sustains all things. Man. Everything that Jesus is is powerful. He created all things. He's a creator. No human has that attribute. We can do things. You, can, you might be working Google here, Coder, you know, or you might work at, you know, some Tesla plant, you know, and, you know, you can build nice electric cars. But create things out of nothing and create this universe as we know it. Who in the world can do that? The third category in terms of the evidence of the divinity of Jesus is his centrality in the New Testament. One thing you can't get away from when you read the New Testament is almost all about Jesus. Jesus, 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 okay? And then the gospel is about Jesus, okay? The letters, it's all about Jesus, the grace of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, following Jesus, okay? Man, Jesus is very central. He's central. He becomes the sort of the object of our following. He's also become the object of our bowing down and adoration, seen times in the gospel. And then in the book of the Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, there's this really an interesting description in Revelation 22, okay? The writer sees the throne, one throne, of the Father and the Lamb. One throne, they're both on it. And everyone's worshiping. You see, the divinity of Jesus, the fact that he's God, as the essence of God, he's the Son of God, is not something that was made up in the Council of Constantinople. It's actually in the text. Now, we dealt with the first question. The second question now comes up. And with each question, my time is going to be a little longer, okay? We dealt with that first one pretty quickly. The second set of questions is, uh, why is it important, okay? Isn't Christianity about unity? And the problems of this world all are stem from the different religions. We're out to get each other because our religious views are different, you know? I was going to make mention of this until later on, but uh, I'm taping during the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, Hamas, okay? Basically, religious views 
of whose right is who has the right to be in the land, okay, and whose prophetic understanding is correct, okay. What happens if you know we just get rid of all the sectarian stuff uh, between Israel and Hamas? And given Christianity has sectarian stuff like, you know, divinity of Jesus, then we, you know, all big one, happy family, you know? The issue with that is that the Bible is not just about doctrine. It's not just about morality. There's a bigger story plot line behind the whole scripture. Now, I'm going to use uh, an example. Uh, a long time ago, there was this uh, founding father who became president, one of the presidents of the United States by the name of Thomas Jefferson. And he wrote a book called The Life and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. And it's a very famous document. I think there are copies of this in the Smithsonian Institute. And uh, Thomas Jefferson, he didn't believe that Jesus was divine. He didn't believe that he was supernatural. He didn't believe he was resurrected from the dead, okay? But he believed that he was a good moral man, had the highest morals, and somehow he bought into the hype and he was crucified, okay? And his followers bought the hype. But he said, you know, uh, you, know you take away what he said, the, the, the garbage, the rubbish, and you get the true teaching of Jesus, okay? And he's a great guy, highest morality. And so what Thomas Jefferson did is he took six Bibles, one in, uh, I think, uh, uh, Greek, one in Latin, uh, two in French, and two English Bibles, and he took a razor and he cut out verses um, to put together what he thought was like his Jesus, okay? Now, his Jesus, like I said, had no miracles, had no supernatural no claims of Jesus' deity, no hints of it, no mention of the resurrection. How many verses was it? 990 verses. He said, well, that's a lot, you know? Thomas Jefferson must have included like the bulk of the first four books of, of the New Testament. Well, 990 is a lot, but he left out over nearly 3,000 verses. You see, once you say, well, you know, can't you just cut it out and just love everybody? Yeah, loving everybody is in the teaching of Jesus. Yeah, but there's a lot more in it that if you're a follower of Jesus, you can't cut out because it becomes, it's the bulk of the teaching of Jesus and about Jesus. And you need to have a fuller picture and you just can't pick and choose what you like, okay? That's not how the Bible works, okay? The Bible has a plot line. It starts with creation. It has a dilemma. And the dilemma is that human humanity has a propensity to do wrong things, okay? And in scripture, the plot line continues that through various heroes, they fail. Through uh, law and sheer obedience, we fail. Through the sending of God's prophets who sort of like tell you point blank what God wants, no one listens to them. And there seems to be no hope for humanity. It's going on the toilet, kind of like what you're experiencing now. And the whole solution of this dilemma isn't that, oh, we just clip out the good moral teaching of Jesus and do it. Well, a place will be a better place, you know? I'll tell you. We'll be better people by living out the words of Jesus. I'm not saying the words of Jesus are not important. There's no benefit to it. There's plenty of benefit. But ultimately, the solution to the problem of humanity is not in our moral obedience. It's in the fact that Jesus Christ would die on the cross for our sins, for forgiveness, for our failings. And a human being can't die on the cross for all of humanity's failings. It takes someone 
of even higher value and worth than all the human beings who are ever born in this world. In Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, early in the ministry in the Gospel of John, says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see, you remove the atoning work of Jesus. And you just have him as some guy who died and was a good guy, but he believed the hype, but, you know, he's got some good, solid moral teaching. You miss out on the whole purpose and the whole benefit and the whole ending plot line and the conclusion of what Scripture was trying to convey. It is very, very important not to be like Thomas Jefferson, but to understand that all of Scripture, including his deity, including his resurrection, including his atonement, including all of who he is, is critical to the understanding of the full story of Scripture. Now, so that deals with the second question. <clears throat> First question was, <clears throat> what's the evidence? We did it biblically, <clears throat> we did it theologically. Excuse me, I'm gonna drink some water. <clears throat> the second question is, is it needed? Is it just optional, you know? The final question is, what's the benefit of this? What does it mean to me? Now, I'm at Cornerstone Church in the main original campus, okay? And one thing you're going to notice if you're here, when and there's no, at this time, there's no, no services where they're at a rear room, okay? We don't have any statues of Jesus or of Mary. Why not? Because <clears throat> they're not important to us. I wouldn't be opposed to seeing a statue of Jesus if you know how he looks. I don't know how he looks like. When I have paintings of Jesus, I don't know how you, have, you know, I don't know how it looks like. But if you are of certain Christian sort of heritage, you would have, you know, pictures or, or you know, a statue of Jesus that you come and you'd bow down to. Okay, and you don't have that. We have a place of worship, but Jesus doesn't abide there. He doesn't live there. Okay, it's not like some holy place. Where I'm taping now, it's not some holy place. Okay. The reason is, is that for us who follow Jesus, we know that a belief in Jesus of who he is fully as the Son of God, fully divine, is not just merely an item of stone that we bow down to or place we go to check the box that we did our religious duty for the week. It's much deeper than uh, that because I know Terry, and I know what Terry wants to teach his people. What's really important, more important than is Jesus God, is the second question. Is Jesus God of your life? And believe it or not, that's the more difficult question. And that's the one that's filled with all the benefits. You see, it's not just a doctrine. It's about understanding that magnificence of Jesus and having him begin to transform you. Plenty of benefits, plenty of transformation. You say, well, Jeff, you know, name a few. Well, I'll name like three of them, okay, that come to mind. The first great benefit when Jesus is understood as divine, the Son of God, is that it begins to set in our lives what is truly valuable in our lives. Say, so what do you mean by that? Okay, I wasn't born in a Christian family, okay? I was born in a... Chinese, blue-collar family. And their um, values for their children were simple, 
stay out of trouble, AKA don't be in a gang, go to school, get a job. That's all we ask. You get in a gang, that's bad. You don't go to school, it's bad. You don't have a job. If you want to put a higher uh, attainment, achievement, you go to a good school, you get a good job, and you make a lot of money. Okay? Those were the goals. And I know, I know plenty of Asian people. Don't have to be Chinese, be Korean, Japanese, you know, Taiwanese. That group of Asians, almost all sort of pursue those goals. And sometimes you meet people who if they miss one of them or two of them or all of them, they feel that their life is incomplete and sometimes they view themselves as failures. Because what happens is that which is good in life, like a job is good in life, money is good in life, getting a, a job, a college degree is good in life, but it becomes a compulsion in us and it begins to torment us if we don't attain what we think we we deserve. <clears throat> I've met people who when they didn't get into the college they want, they crushed. Met other people when they got laid off, it's hard for them to rebound. Not that it's easy, but it crushes you. You begin to feel your life is worthless. For others, it might not be education or money. But we have other things that uh, drive us. Uh, Tim Keller would call us the idols in our lives. For some, it's relationship. Relationships are great. I've been married over 40 years, okay? Nearly 50 years, okay? And you know what? It can be easy to have relationships be the driving compulsion so that if you never have it, you feel your life is miserable. You blame people, blame God, blame your parents. Oh, what in the world's happening? Is that you? For others, it could be, um, if you're a younger person, mm, social media, likes. How many people like you? You know, amongst youth, depression is like at 50% as high as like it's ever been because of the lack of human interaction and we're into social media and you know people liking us. You wanna crush someone, post something that is negative and have it spread about that amongst all your friends. If you're in high school or junior high school. Man, I mean, enough stories of people just take their own lives because of that. You know, these are bad things when that happens. But what Jesus does is when he is God, and he becomes your God. You realize that all these things that we thought were like, oh man, we better have it in order to live, you know. You know, they're good. But you don't have to have them to live. Because Jesus gives us life. And you could be the smartest person or well, you could be someone who is like an imbecile. You could be really beautiful, influencer, you know, get, you know? What happens you're not beautiful, not an influencer, man. It's like, holy crap, man. It's like my life is terrible. You know? Here's the benefit of Jesus and that he's God. Once he becomes your God, all these other things can begin to be cut down a notch into second and third place. And you may not be anxious anymore. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying there's a great benefit to make Jesus Lord and God of your life. Not just a doctrine to hold, but an understanding that begins to transform your life. The second benefit is that um, Jesus will bring forth full justice in our lives. 
For some of us, we suffer because of lack of achievement. For others, we suffer because we have been victims of some terrible things in life. What? How many of you have ever been beaten up? How many of you have ever been beaten up for no reason, but for the fact you're a minority? How many of you have ever been called racial slurs? I had to stop because it brings back some memories, you know? You know, I can never undo those things. Never undo those things. Not of heart for minorities who have been subject to grave discrimination during the history of the United States. It's buried in your soul. It's very hard to get rid of because the memories will always float back to the top every so often. How am I going to resolve that? And then there are greater injustices. Violent crime done to you. Maybe it's your parents. Violent crimes for them, from them, on you. Maybe you were falsely accused and had to do time in prison. You think about the Ukraine war, when they came over and they just like mowed down people, you know, pillaged, you know, sexually abused people, you know? And then what's happening in Israel between Israelis and Hamas? You know, some of the things I read, it's like, holy cow, how can anyone do that? Like cutting throats of babies, beheading babies, and it's kind of like, holy cow. You could have your vengeance. But the healing of the heart that's a greater issue. And then the retaliation by the Israelis upon Hamas, it's going to be terrible if it's not already beginning terrible. Because Hamas is not in like, oh, we're in a White House and our, our military is in compounds. It's spread amongst the people. And the Israeli is going to impose great vengeance upon them. And thousands of innocent Palestinian civilians will die. Now, I'm not going to talk about who's justified, okay? I'm going to have a series of radical honesty, uh, my short five, seven minute messages on the Israeli Hamas crisis. I'll start taping on Friday, okay? And I'll talk about it in greater length. But I'll tell you, there might be justifications on both sides. And there's going to be atrocities on both sides. And there's going to be reasons why they go to war. But it's going to be brutal. It's going to be deadly. And from that aspect, God grieves. I'm not getting into it that Israel has a right to defend itself. I'm not answering that question. I'm not going to answer this question in this message is, you know, is, a, is Gaza an apartheid state? You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the sheer perspective of God upon this world. War is evil. Things that people do are res reflexive responses of who we are. We try to bring justice in life. You do this, I will do that back to you. But you know what? There's never a full restoration, a full healing of the soul. But if Jesus is God, and you believe all that he says he will do, and you believe all everything that he has done for you, he promises to return, have the books open, 
and judge human beings exactly for everything they did. And then in Revelation chapter 22, he will wipe the tears from our eyes. You know why? Because humans can't do that. We can only do justice by the book, retribution, give you money because we damaged your property or put you in jail because you hurt us. But the full restoration and the full healing of the soul and the removing of the anguish is part of the whole package of who Jesus is and what he will do. You see, it's just that moral teaching to follow. It's a true healing of the heart and of the hurt that we all experience. The final benefit of Jesus is that he sustains us in this life. In the book of um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, you know, let me look at the verses before verse 9, okay? Uh, Paul talks about how, how he is, uh, has this uh, messenger from Satan, the thorn in the flesh, that really bothers him. And three times he prayed to have it removed. And this is how um, Jesus responded to him. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is weird. Chronic distress, the power of Christ, not in creation or doing miracles, but in the ability to strengthen you and to sustain you to even greater heights than you can ever imagine. Because in the human dilemma and suffering and the frailty, if you understand who Jesus is, that he is God, he can turn that around and sustain us in life so that you not only know him better, your life is actually more focused, and fulfilled to the glory of God. Now you may ask, Jeff, easy to say that thing, but how does it look like Jesus sustaining us? Why well, I go back, I was raised in Chinatown, New York City on Mont Street for the first seven years of my life. <clears throat> so it's a tenement one bedroom, five people, okay, for seven years. And then before that, I was born, my older brother and sister, my parents lived in another place, okay, in Chinatown. Then they moved to Corona, which is a Hispanic neighborhood. And uh, I was like the only Chinese in the school, so I was uh, picked on. All my life, I went to public school, public elementary school, public junior high, public high school, and then went, even went to a public college in Harlem, New York City. I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth or an evangelical spoon where I went to like Christian like schools, okay? My father was a waiter. My mom was a seamstress with the garment union. Worked in sweatshops in New York. Like 40 years of her life. When I went to graduate school to study for ministry, I worked. My favorite job was for three and a half years, I washed trucks for United Parcel Service from 10.30 to 2.30 in the morning. Okay? I started ministry when, I'm, when I was 28. I'm 67. Not quite 40 years, 39. Okay, I'll, I'll give me that year, round it off to 40. 
Energy is tough. Financially tough. Raising kids in a fishbowl. Bouts of depression, got to be honest with you. How about now? My wife has cancer. Blood cancer. About a year ago, finished treatment. And then about 11 months ago, I suffered a heart attack. The widow maker. Actually, this is the first uh, sermon back at Cornerstone since my heart attack. Since my wife was diagnosed and had chemo. And you know what? All of these things. Everything I said to my beginning to this day, all the illnesses, Jesus has sustained me. Honest, he has sustained me. And my wife and I would talk, and in the moments of sheerest honesty, we would say, Basically, we would have it no other way in the midst of a cardiac condition and cancer. Because then you realize that God sustains you. And you realize the greatness of Jesus. And you realize in our weakness and our frailty, the power of Christ is perfected. Because actually, we don't have the ability or the strength to actually achieve what we really think should last in this life. It is the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, he oversees my life and he oversees the life of everyone who follows him. And I hope for those who are considering Jesus, but have not yet, let's say, signed on the dotted line, would consider Jesus. Not just as a doctrine to check but Jesus as God, and that you make him your God. For others, I hope in the midst of what you are going through, you will see the mighty hand of God carry you to the end. Because he's a great God and a great compassionate lover of us. Let me end in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I just give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, who he is, what he did for us, and how important it is that we have a mighty God in Jesus, Lord, that it is not just about religious duty or activity, but something that is real to carry with us in this life. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
rolling like a hurricane I'm over the bridge and under the rain If everything's falling If everything's changed If I'm in the open If I'm in the way What am I doing here If you're not with me What have I got to live for it's just my own dream Take it back to the beginning Back to the start When gravity's pulling You're still holding my heart You come crashing down Crashing down do believe you are who you said you are. We believe you are God's unique son who has come among us, that you are the very face of the Father, God revealed in human form. If we embrace you this way, you promised us the gift of life for God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have life everlasting, overflowing now and yet to come. That's what he's inviting us into. If we will embrace him as he truly is, a fully human being that was also God among us. So Lord, we just ask that you would continue to move in our lives, bring peace in the places where we're troubled, bring healing to the places where we feel damaged and defeated, and bring us courage in the places where we're afraid. Living God who has come among us, come in and be with us now we pray in Jesus' name.